Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, Saurabh. Hello. Hello, Saurabh. Hi. Hello, sir. Uh, we'll just wait for others to join. Uh, okay, no worries. And uh, on my screen, it doesn't give me share my screen option, so maybe that will come later on. Yeah, I just. Oh yes, it's, it's coming now. It's coming now. Now it says share my webcam, but not share my screen. Yeah, just a minute. Thank you. Um, to, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's right. Right, I'm in now. So I'll wait until you guys are ready. Hello, Saurabh, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There was some uh, connection loss uh, when we started off uh, with the. Uh, yeah. We'll just wait for yeah. uh, others to join. Yeah, no worries. As I said, I've taken uh, half a day off. So if we, and I don't think we'll overrun. I put 
two hours in as a safety margin. I think we'll finish in an hour and a half. Uh, meanwhile, our HOD, uh, Dr. Bharat Bhanose, uh, he is also uh, joined. Sir, if you have, if you want to speak, you can please. Sorry? Just, uh, our HOD, yeah. Dr. Bharat yeah. Bhanose, uh, yeah. had sent him the invitation as well. He has uh, joined and just a minute. Right. Just ask. The more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. And during the webinar, is it normal for speakers to keep their webcam on or is it distracting? In that case, I'll switch it off. Sir, whatever is comfortable for you. It's, it's I'm, not okay. I'm happy either way. So I'll, if I switch my webcam off, then people will actually focus on the screen and not look at my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> what is your name, by the way? Sorry? What is your name? Sir, myself, Saurabh Zogayaka. Oh. You look different from your profile photograph. <laughs> you look a lot younger. <laughs> hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay, I will switch my webcam off. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can ready? when I'm ready. Yes, sir. Hey, you tell me hello? when you're ready. Yeah? Uh, sir, I'll I'll notify you. Uh, to all the attendees, we are just waiting for others to join. We'll start shortly. Hello. Yes, sir. How many are there? Sir, almost 19 have joined. They have joined. Okay. Hey, the number so is increased. How... Actually, we, we started off a bit late. We started off 5 to 10 minutes late. So maybe some might have joined and then went away. So we'll just have a five minutes break so that uh, if anyone wants to join, can join. Okay. And uh, I, I'm proposing that once I finish the actual training material, before we yeah. move into uh, the actual case study, we give people have a five or 10 minutes comfort break. Uh, Otherwise, uh, or do you not want any breaks inside? I'm, I'm sir, happy we, we'll, yeah, we will continue it, sir. Okay, no break then. Yeah. All right, no worries. Hello, Puravit, sir. Anji. Uh, sir, I am Dr. Bhanwase. I am heading department, chemical engineering department. Oh, pleased to meet you. On the yeah, on the, the same here. Yeah, oh. <laughs> on different platform we are meeting here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am very happy to. You know, speak. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Go please on. continue. No, no. I am very happy to you know take part in such an event because. LIT has done so much for uh, me right, in my life. Right. And I like to repay a small debt. Uh -huh. Right. Actually, we have started this type of uh, lectures during these COVID sessions. Mm. And uh, that will be beneficial for students. Yes, uh, that, that's excellent. But let's see how this one goes. And yeah. then I can offer you some more topics of interest, which are not normally in your curriculum, but they are indirectly related. Because when people start working, uh, real actually, life, uh, they Right, right. That will be useful for students. Yeah, uh, go on. What are you saying? Uh, actually, uh, these type of topics are very important for the students when they are uh, entering in a real situation. Hmm. That, that's what I found when I started working as apprentice paint technologist after graduating from LIT. I joined uh, a British uh -huh. company called Blunder Leomite, which is now called Garware Paints. I don't know if they're still going in Thane. So I joined there, uh -huh. and uh, while the theory was strong, practical was almost nil. So, uh -huh. But that was a good way to start. When you start as an apprentice, you know, people sort of share their skills and experience and knowledge with you because they're not threatened. Uh -huh. There's a fast learning curve there. 
Right. Actually, for the these students when they graduate, actually mm -hmm. first five years for uh, is for uh, their learning only. Actually, they should they have to learn many things in uh, industry as as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is very important actually because they have to see the real life uh, situations there. And uh, in classroom sessions, we have theoretical subjects, fundamentals, and all these things. So this is what we have. And yeah, this type, uh, type of lectures. Hmm. Hello? Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. So this type of topics are very important. And many times, uh, uh, the safety is neglected uh, part of study in curriculum also. But uh, in LIT, we have added this curriculum separately. So that is actually elective subject. So student can opt for that. Right. I'll try and persuade them to become safety engineers like me. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. uh, because one of the benefits of specializing in safety is that uh, you can go into any industry. You're not stuck to say if you are graduating with oils or say paper and pulp. If you have done safety, you can go into any industry, which is why in 1998, I changed my career from being a paint technologist and a plant manager into safety. And uh, that's paid me great dividends because I came out of the paint industry in which I was working for almost 20 years into oil industry and other industry. You get, you get more chances of promotion and going up in life if you have something more than the basic engineering degree, which is which is a must. But I'm going to tell the students in my closing remarks that they should study engineering first, but they should also uh -huh. plan ahead of what they should do. One of the things I learned when I had my first job in Thane and then I moved to Courts of India Printing Inks in Sakinaka in right. Mumbai. Right. And then I went uh -huh. to Baroda as a project engineer. And one of the things I learned, that I didn't have any project management skills, so the contractors were running rings around me. So then I studied the industrial engineering certificate in MS University Baroda. And that gave me an insight into what these guys were doing to me. And then we turned the tables on them, became more efficient. Uh, and nowadays, uh, uh, a chemical engineer is supposed to be multitasking anyway, multidisciplined. So they need to have either safety background, economics, or they must specialize in something. I'm not going to say which one, because I'm right. biased to safety because that's what I did. But there, there are many mm -hmm. other branches they can specialize in. Especially, I think most right. of the bright students will take MBA anyway. Right, exactly. Uh, sir, shall we start? Uh, because okay. the people are yet joining and yeah. we'll just start because we have got a okay. yeah. session. That will continue. Okay. So are yeah. you going to introduce uh, the topic yeah, or shall I just go into it straight away? Yeah. I'm going to turn off uh, my webcam now. Yes. Yeah, sure. yeah? Uh, just to give us short introduction about Sir, uh, uh, Mr. Shailesh Purohit uh, is 1974 batch pass out, uh, BSc Tech. Uh, right now for us it is chemical technology. Right now, uh, post that uh, presently is working as a process safety engineer at CLH Pipeline Systems Limited. Uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction about the topic. The aim of the on, of the online workshop is to provide an overview of how boat tire risk analysis can be used to identify existing or missing controls in preventing major accident hazards. So basically, what we are going to uh, see here is a uh, 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 software uh, which will help us in identifying various types of risk because uh, just having a theoretical uh, know-how about a particular process may may or may not be that much. Uh, uh, informative but we need some kind of a tool to take into account all the risks associated for a particular chemical process or uh, unit operation or unit process so i welcome on behalf of lit sir uh, i thank you for accept, accepting our invitation and guiding our students i hope uh, all the students would be benefited out of this and post uh, this also if you have got any questions any specific question uh, there will be a session on uh, specific questions we'll keep it at the end of the session so i request all the attendees to just uh, uh, write the, write down the questions in the chat section or in the questions pane uh, we'll take it at the end of the session 
and if you have got any specific questions please direct it to me and i'll send it uh, to professor and he'll be more than happy to reply right so over to you sir thank you sir so i'm going to start my presentation first of all welcome all and i wish to thank you for your time and hopefully have the patience to bear with me if i'm going too fast or too slow just give me a kick why jog liquor sir so sure sir. sure sir. all right so just let me know when you can see my presentation what's happening yeah I'll start with a word of thanks because I wish to thank Dr. Saurabh Joglikar and Dr. Raju Mankar for giving me this opportunity to speak to you and share some of my experiences. In the current lockdown climate, I feel that it must be extremely frustrating and worrying for all of us, including myself, to think about our futures. But we must be positive. We must believe that our time will change for better. So please may I start the presentation with this positive message. I wish to acknowledge training material copyright of Risk Tech and CGE Risk Management Services. And in my final, one of my final slides, I will give you lots of references and also explain what these references are about. So if this topic uh, grabs your attention and you wish to know more, there's lots of material available. One of the things as uh, chemical engineering students and uh, learning equipment designs is you must understand the codes. So I'm not very familiar with the Indian codes, but I can point you to some of the international codes which are applicable universally. So no, no matter where you work in the world, uh, if you design your equipment to these international codes, it will help you a lot. Okay. Hey, come on. So first, as part of your learning about equipment design, how this session fits in. So I had to think about it when I was approached by the LIT committee. And I thought that Bowtie will help you to predict when you design an equipment, you must also think about what happens if people don't use it correctly. So that's where this topic is coming from. And this workshop is to provide you a brief overview of a Bowtie method of analysis of HSE risk. So HSE stands for health, safety and environmental risks from threats and what is the threat i put it in bold letters and i'll explain all this as we get, get along so that might lead to loss in terms of major accidents i'm not talking about minor accidents minor accident could be say someone is walking around and the, the floor is a bit slippery and he falls or she falls and hurts her head and is hospitalized that's serious enough but to me major accident is multiple fatalities I'm not aware or I'm not sure whether any of my attendees in this webinar uh, have any connections with Visakhapatnam, the incident there, but I'll mention it towards the end and see how this study can help you if you were the designer of that equipment which failed and lost to uh, serious fatalities and uh, pollution in Visakhapatnam. Uh, please stop me, uh, send a message to Glicker, sir, because if you are personally involved and you don't wish to me to speak about it, but please let me know. I'll talk about it right at the end. Okay, so the, it, this will show you how to design an equipment which will not fail. There's lots of fun. It's, it's a very qualitative method, so it's not quantitative. It won't tell you how big is the risk. It will tell you there is a risk. It's very visual operator friendly tool. So one of the things you will see when you start working in industry in say a year's time or three years time or four years time, whenever, is there'll be people who are there who are probably more mature than you. They have more experience, but they're still working as operators at the plant level. One of the things in life that I learned right from day one when I started as an apprentice paint technologist was these people have got lifetime of experience and if you approach them rightly they will teach you the job you will be very well equipped i'm sure from lit with your theoretical knowledge but practical knowledge only come with time and to approach people in a friendly and people skills manner 
and the operators at, at the floor, shop floor level is very good. And bow tie is like a theoretical knowledge, but when you involve the operators, the, the maintenance technicians, the electrical craftsmen who work on the factory, on the equipment that you have sort of designed or you are responsible for, uh, it's good to have their input. So never, never do this isolated in your office, always involve people. And it's it's very visual tool as you'll see when we get along. So I'm not going to cause death by PowerPoint presentation, but lively interactive with lots of interruptions and fun. Okay, here we go. So my objectives today are to explain what a bow tie is and typical uses, including various terms we use in the assessment. So first, the first part of the session is fairly basic. I'll show you how how a bow tie is constructed, and then we move into more interesting stuff. That's the case today. To build a bow tie risk assessment for a theoretical bulk chemical storage, and uh, coming from proto, I, I grew up in Nagpur, so I've chosen Ambazari Lake. I'm sure your local council will not permit a new factories near Ambazari Lake, but just say for example, we try to build one. What what are the things we should look out for? I hope that will sort of put picture into context for you and you can relate to it. And then we'll work out threats, consequences, and potential risk controls. Because we are limited for time, I will give you the threats and the consequences and it will be your job working with me to work out what risk control measures you can think of and keep the session within the time limit we have been allowed today. I will just look for two risk controls on both sides. In real life, this workshop takes about six to eight hours or sometimes two to three days, depending on how complex the situation is. Okay, so there are other hazard identification techniques and some of you may have heard or especially heard about this. And there's a very famous saying, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple and wrong. And that was Mr. Men Menken in 1880 to 56. So always don't think this, the answers to industrial problems are simple. If they are very clear and simple, the problems would have been solved ages ago. So always keep your mind open to possibilities. This is the most obvious solution sometimes is not the right solution. That is my message. So the other methods which we use as uh, in my daily tasks as chemical engineers are these, and you m might learn about those in your maybe final year. I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Joglicker, sir. Can you sort of do you know if this is included in the LIT syllabus? We do have an elective, but uh, there is no such uh, different uh, or a specific uh, as of analysis methods that have been taught. It's not okay. a part of curriculum. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to do this. And uh, as part of this uh, semi uh, webinar, uh, I will request Dr. Joglikar, sir, to send you a copy of this presentation. So if you miss writing something down, don't worry, you'll get a full copy of the whole presentation in PDF format after the session. So these are some of the techniques. So you can have a what if checklist. So something like that in an equipment you're designing, say it's a distillation column. You, you can ask your question when you're designing this, what if the column is undersized? Can it lead to thermal expansion and uh, damage to the vessel? Will it burst? Uh, this sort of approach, which is very simple. Failure modes and effect analysis, which is a bit more complicated and it's usually used for highly complex refinery type of situations. Fault tree analysis is another one where you look at a fault. For example, if I say my car didn't start this morning, that's the fault. Then I look at why did it not start? So one could be there was no petrol. Second could be my battery was flat. So why was there no petrol? So you ask question further down the line until you come to the root cause. It's sometimes also called the five wives investigation technique. So there are other appropriate methods and this is what we'll be talking about, bow ties. Following the lecture, we'll go through high-level case objectives, uh, case study.
So what is the bow tie? No, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not referring to the figure on the left, but I'm referring to the figure on the right. So that is what a typical bow tie looks like. And uh, this, it may not be very readable, but it will become because I'm going to break it down into each component now. Okay, are we ready to rock and roll, boys and girls? Here we go. Now, this is a clip I'm showing you. And just think before you watch the clip, there's no sound, so don't try to turn the volume up. There's no sound to this, but have a look. You, some of you might have seen this. And uh, what do you think this incident was caused by? So I'm going to now start the clip and hopefully you should see a moving picture there. Nope. Can you see the picture, Joglika, sir? It's visible. Ah. It's visible. Yes? Huh? Uh, it is visible, sir. OK. So there is this lady filling in petrol. And it's probably somewhere in America where there are these automatic petrol filling machines with sensors. So she's punched in how much she wants. She's paid for it. She's now putting the pump into the filling tank. Sorry about the hazy picture, but the quality was poor to start with. So now she's filling the petrol in. Now she's nicely waiting for the tank to fill up. I know we don't do this in Nagpur or India, which is a good safety measure. We have someone who actually watches it all the time. Now here she comes. Oh, what's happened there? She's brave. So she does that, she drops it on, and she runs away to safety. Okay, so I'll just escape that and go back to my presentation. So the first thought that will come to mind is, what will cause an ignition? So if you learned about the fire triangle, for a fire to take place, you need three things. You need oxygen, you need ignition or heat, and you need uh, a fuel. So in this case, when you're fueling a car with petrol, you've got petrol vapors coming out all the way. That's just the nature of the beast, and even more so in a hot country like India. So the vapors are around. So oxygen is obviously around, otherwise you can't breathe. So what was the source of ignition here? It was static. So when the lady is moving around and she's not wearing anti-static shoes, there's a static charge. And you might sometimes experience this in real life, well, especially when the climate is dry and you walk and you touch a door handle and gives you a bit of a jetka, an electric shock, yeah? So that is static electricity. So in this case, there was this fire because there was enough static on her body which, which ignited the vapors around the filling area. Okay, so moving on. This is where uh, I'll ask Dr. Jogrekal sir to show you a, a video clip. It's about four or six minutes. And this is a type of an incident, which is uh, something which my company does where I work. We do exactly the same thing. So just put down some of your thoughts and ask yourself a question. Okay, so over to you, Joglika, sir. Yeah. I'll need to yeah. stop sharing my screen. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, sir. I, I'll oh, make okay. the. Okay, you take over. Nice one. I think there, there would be some lag in the video and the audio, but okay. nevertheless, we can anyway start. Right. Okay. Unmuted. Today, October 21st, 2009, Caribbean Petroleum Corporation, or CAPECO, began a routine transfer of more than 10 million gallons of unleaded gasoline from a tanker vessel docked two and a half miles from the facility. The only storage tank that was large enough to hold the full shipment of gasoline 
was already in use. As a result, Capeco planned to distribute the gasoline among four smaller storage tanks. This operation would take more than 24 hours to complete. During transfer operations, one Capeco operator was stationed at the dock, while another monitored valves controlling gasoline delivery at the terminal. By noon the next day, October 22nd, two of the tanks were filled with gasoline. The operators then diverted the gasoline into two other tanks, tanks 409 and 411. Capeco used a simple mechanical device consisting of a float and automatic measuring tape to determine the liquid level inside the tanks. An electronic transmitter card sent the liquid level measurements to the control room. But the transmitter card on tank 409 was out of service, so operators were required to manually record the tank level readings once every hour. At 10 p.m. the night of the 22nd, as tank 411 reached maximum capacity, operators fully opened the valve to tank 409. At that time, an operator read the level of tank 409 from the side gauge and reported it to his supervisor. The supervisor estimated that tank 409 would be full at 1 a.m. But shortly before midnight, tank 409 started to overflow. Gasoline sprayed from the vents, forming a vapor cloud and a pool of liquid in the tank's containment tank. The CSB determined that a total of nearly 200,000 gallons of gasoline, the equivalent of 20 full tanker trucks, was released from the six vents on the tank. On a warm, windless night, the gasoline vapor cloud grew to cover an area of 107 acres. At midnight, the tank farm operator was ready to perform the hourly check of tank 409. But before reaching the tank, he noticed a strong odor of gasoline. He alerted the dock operator to shut off the flow of gasoline to the tank. The tank farm operator and another operator met the supervisor at the edge of the terminal. There, they observed a white fog rising approximately three feet above the ground. The supervisor sent one operator to the security gate to stop anyone from entering the site. Then the supervisor and the tank farm operator drove to an elevated point away from the cloud to try to identify the source of the leak. Meanwhile, the pooled gasoline flowed through open valves in the containment dike toward the wastewater treatment area. There, the vapor reached electrical equipment, which ignited the cloud. A flash fire raced back toward the storage tanks. Seven seconds later, there was a massive explosion, registering 2.9 on the Richter scale. The time was 12.23, approximately 26 minutes after the overflow began. Soon, 17 of the facility's storage tanks were engulfed in flames. Fortunately, the three Capeco employees escaped the tank farm, and there were no fatalities. Flames from the explosion could be seen from as far as eight miles away. The shock wave damaged approximately 300 nearby homes and businesses. Fires continued to burn for over two days. Hello. Hello, I'm correct now. I need yes. to show my screen. Yeah. So, where's the mic? Okay. Just bear with me, folks, when I regain my screen. I seem to have lost my screen. Where's my presentation? I'm looking for my presentation, boys and girls. Just bear with me whilst it comes back. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm back now. So we just watched this uh, massive explosion video. It, it is something which my employer does every day of the year, 365 days a year. We get sheep coming to the east and the west coast 
and then uh, people from there are in radio control with the people in the tank farm and then they we actually do the uh, switch between tanks so the things to think about later on is how could this incident have been prevented what was the real cause of the incident and the answers to that will make you a better designer a better chemical engineer okay so now i'm going to show you a bit of a fun clip i hope you've not seen it before if you have seen it then bear with me because some of you may not have seen it so this is about the risk from an inadequate ss spec i'll give you a few seconds to just digest what you're looking at what you're looking at is is this crane by the side of the wharf something has fallen inside the water yeah and it's trying to lift it out so you can see what it's trying to lift out so it's a small van which has unfortunately dropped into the water it looks funny but it's not probably not funny it's probably a serious incident and we hope that the person inside the van escaped safely so there we have a crane to try to lift the van out but you can see here can you see my mouse this is not really very doesn't look very safe and this happens the crane which was trying to lift the vehicle out of the waters has fallen in as well and this is a picture which so what will you do if you were the manager of this site or seeing this operation up hoga this is what we do then we get a bigger one a stronger one and then it's trying to lift up the first one and then maybe the second one now if this was a live classroom environment i would ask for a show of hands how many of you think that this truck will fall in and how many of you think that this truck will do the job and won't fall in the answer is this is a better solution in fact this is what they should have done and the reason for that is it is a, a lot stronger bigger and it's got these outriggers can you see where my mouse is moving so this is like a fit giant feet hydraulic feet which stabilize the truck and it stop it from falling over so the purpose of showing you these slides was to make you understand that when you're trying to solve a problem you must do a proper risk assessment and guess what bow ties is one of the ways of doing the risk assessment there are other methods which i showed you earlier like hazard hazops a fema faulty event etc and bow ties is one of these but bow tie is very popular nowadays because it's very easy to do so now we get into the nitty-gritty of building a bow tie so in the bow tie the first step is define your hazard and if you don't define your hazard very clearly then the whole exercise becomes useless so hazard now you might have heard of this term hazard and risk are they one and the same no they are not a risk is a product of the chance that the hazard would take place. I'll give you a very common example. Say you are making garam chai, you're making tea, and you're using a hot water kettle. Okay? So here you got water boiling away in a kettle on the gas or maybe electric kettle. As long as it's boiling away, the hazard is thermal hazard, hot water. If it falls on your skin, it will burn your skin or cause you serious injury. Yeah? But now think, as long as the hazard is in the kettle, which is designed to contain hot water, in fact, it's designed to heat it up, and you are away from it, there's no danger. So your risk is zero. The moment you pick up the kettle and say so there is a sudden noise behind you, and your hand shakes and hot water comes and falls on, the, on your skin and burns you, then your hazard and risk has become the same. So this is the same when you start working in. A chemical plant or mechanical plant or any plant the hazard is always there the hazard has an inherent property so if you take the example of the lg polymers was it in visakhapatnam the hazard was styrene styrene a nasty chemical for those of you well most of you will probably not remember this 
But when I was uh, living in India, I was 300, 400 kilometers from Bhopal, where this huge toxic release of methyl isocyanate case took place. So the hazard there was methyl isocyanate. As long as it was safely contained, the risk to the local uh, population was zero. But the fact that things went wrong and the gas was released and thousands of people were killed and even now, even to this generation, 30, 40 years later, people are still having babies born with missing limbs. That's the risk. The risk got realized. So before we start building a bow tie, be very clear, what's your hazard? And I'll give you these answers when we do the case study. So you ask the right questions in the right order. So the first very most important step is define the hazard. The second step is what happens when the hazard is released? What happens when the controls is lost? So that's known as the top event. So this is the term terminology which is used across the whole industry for bow ties. Hazard, top event, threat, and consequence. So when you look at the left hand side, you see these threats. So threat is defined as something which causes the hazard to be released. How can control be lost? So that's your threat. It's always in blue. And your consequence is what happens when you lose control. So your fourth question you ask is how can the event develop? What are the potential outcomes? So now I'll just go through the definitions in more detail. So here I have an example. A hazard is put in a yellow high and yellow and black box. This is just a convention. You can ask the question if you want pretty pink and uh, bright green, I don't care. But this is what uh, international uh, sort of methodology is. This is what the software suppliers uh, sort of recommend. Okay, so jet fuel storage and transport is a hazard. What's the hazard? The hazard is the jet fuel. Why is it hazardous? Because if it's lost containment, it can catch fire, or it can cause a killing of the fish and the animal and the marine life. And we all heard of this huge shipping disasters when oil is leaked from a shipping container and then causes excessive loss of marine life. So that is a hazard. As I said, the top event is your loss of control, loss of containment. So when you release the hazard, it's because of the top event. It's usually a loss of control. And it's usually shown in the red, yellow, orange circle. Comments as before. Everyone with me so far? Anyone fallen asleep? No? Thank you. There yes. you go. All right. So now these are the typical threats. Now remember this, when we start doing the a case study, some of this will be helpful. Mind you, I've given you the threats anyway. So typical health, safety, and environment. So that's HSC. Are if you've got a product in a storage, overfill of storage tank. If you've got a product in a pipeline, overpressure of a pipeline. And as chemical engineers, you understand to stop overpressure of pipelines, you might design a pressure safety relief system or a thermal safety, uh, thermal pressure relief valve, TRVs. There can be dynamic overpressure surge. So that is if you are having, say, huge amount of crude oil coming into your refinery from a ship on the, on the jetty. And uh, for some reason, somebody stops uh, an emergency valve, then the, there's a huge pressure in the pipeline and that causes a surge and that might cause pipeline to burst or the walls or the flanges of the fittings to break open. That's dynamic overpressure. You can have overpressure due to thermal expansion. And that is very true in a hot climate like India, especially in the summer when the temperature, ambient temperature in Nagpur, and I've experienced that to be around 40 to 45 degrees centigrade. So if there's a liquid contained in a storage tank, if there is no relief designed, what will happen? The liquid will try the vapor will have tremendous pressure and try to escape into the air. So you can start smelling whatever the chemical is and so on. So these are the typical sort of threats. And remember all the threats are always on the left-hand side of a bow tie. 
more about that later on. So there, with the blue border box. Then you have what are known as controls. And this is the aim of our exercise today. I'll give you the threads because we haven't got time. Otherwise, I would let you work out the threads as well. But I'm being kind and gentle to you today because it's your special day. So against an overfill of storage tanks. Now remember these. This will come in handy when we do the exercise. You can have a barrier. You can have a barrier which are designed to neutralize the threads. So the whole idea is to stop things moving from the left hand side from the threads to loss of control, which is the, your top event to the consequences. If you don't have the overfill because of all these good barriers in place, then you won't have the incident, would you? So these are controls. And the other thing you'll notice with these barriers, they have color coded. Yellow means it's reasonable. Green means it's good. And I'll define these barriers to you uh, in, in the following slides. That's what I've just said. So this is what I was meaning by saying, now you can have your risk control barriers of different types. You can have a behavior one. You can have an active hardware. You can have socio-technical, you can have continuous, you can have passive hardware. We'll talk about this when you do the case study. So I don't, would, I wouldn't encourage you to read the whole definition, but just we'll take one example. So for example, a behavior, a barrier or risk control is defined as a behavior when a person is both responsible for detecting, making a decision and performing action. So for example, there's an operator in the control room of your chemical plant and he, he gets an alarm on his screen or it might be an audible siren going off. But that siren is just a siren. So the operator based on his training, knowledge, experience, competence, attitude, etc., all those personal factors, understands what he has to do. He might have to go and stop heating. He might have to stop uh, filling a tank because it's just reached the alarm. Okay, so that's a behavior type of uh, barrier. And there are others which I'll leave you to read on later on because after all, why should I do all the work? You should be doing some as well. Then this is the thing about effectiveness, the color coding. Why color coding? Because when you do a bow tie, if you look at the colors and if everything is red, you know there's something really wrong. And if everything is green, then you need to start wor worrying about it as well. So if a control is always there, and it's more than 99.5% of working and no human involvement involved, it's very reliable and so on. And something which is unreliable or very unreliable, which is very rarely used, and there's less than 30% of chance of working when required and continuous human involvement. It's a very complex task. It would be a red barrier, okay? So this is just the color coding we'll use with the case study. Then sometimes you have something called escalation factors. So this is when there's a barrier. So it, it can be used to give clarity when you are not very sure that the control will work all the time, or you have a specific concern, or you want to record actions for weak controls. But be careful not to repeat information. Okay, so here I've got an example. If you look at this overfill of storage tanks, I am claiming that my operator is trained, he follows the uh, product or job instructions during filling operations. So he will not overfill the tank. That's what I'm claiming. But then I know that sometimes we will change design and the information may not be updated on the job instructions that person is following. If that happens, then my barrier is no longer existing, it's weaker. Sometimes my operator will go and open the wrong valve or he selects trying to fill 10,000 liters in a 5,000 tank. Why would he do that? That's human error. And that's a different presentation I can do later on, not today. So human factors is also very, very important. Why do people who are trained, experienced and competent doing the job sometimes go and do the wrong thing and that results in a big accident? It's like, and I'm sure most of you might have experienced this, you go, go to, into what's known as an autopilot mode. 
you do things without remembering having done that. Okay, and then there might be a uh, error in the job instruction. So these are just examples of escalation factors. And we'll think about this when we do the case study, if it's applicable. Then we look at the consequences. Consequences could be pollution, could be fire, could be explosion, could be prosecution by competent authority. So when I use the word competent authority, what it means is it's whoever is in charge of your process from the government's regulation. So for example, a factory inspector, he would then prosecute you if you manage to lose control and cause an accident, a big one. So for example, storage of diesel in tanks, big tanks, if I lose them, if I don't have any risk controls on my right-hand side, and these are known as mitigatory risk controls. So the ones on the left-hand side, uh, bow ties, uh, risk controls are called preventive because they prevent the threat. And the ones here are uh, called mitigative. It helps you to recover. So the consequence of losing, say, diesel without any risk controls in place on the other side, you can have a, just a pool of liquid or you can have a pool of fire. Okay? So consequences are shown in red boxes. So a completed bow tie, and this is just a little por portion, you might not be able to read it. It's just to show you why is it called a bow tie, because it looks roughly like a bow tie. Okay, now I will do a little, uh, quick demo to get you into the mode of thinking. So I'm going to stop showing my screen whilst I change my uh, screen to the software. And I'll start. Choglekar uh, sir, can you see my screen now with the bow tie? Yeah, we, it is visible. Okay, so this is just to sort of ease you into the case study to give you an idea of how a bow tie works with a very everyday example. Say you come to LIT to study when there is no lockdown, obviously. You might be using your motorbike or you might be having a car and you're driving to car. So what can go wrong? Well, obviously you can have a minor accident where you just hit a pedestrian and he just gives you a few choice uh, galias and then that's it. Or it could be more serious, your car's got fire. And if you have sort of hurt someone seriously, then you could be prosecuted by police for dangerous driving, or you could suffer a serious injury. and might be in hospital for three months with a fracture. Yeah, so these are the bad things that can happen. So what can cause that? Could be bad weather, very heavy rain, your wipers are not working, you can hardly see where you're going. Or you could be a bad driver, you're trying to overtake from the wrong side. Or you could have lack of maintenance on your cars, so when you use your brakes, the brakes are not working. And very typically in Nagpur, where in my days, I don't know if it's improved now, Joklika, sir, potholes and obstructions that can cause you to lose control while you're driving. So let's see, against bad driving, <coughs> What kind of a barrier uh, against, sorry, against uh, heavy rains? One of my barriers could be, control could be, uh, drive slowly, okay? So when I say I drive slowly, I can now start looking at it and I can start putting things in there. So I can look, driving slowly would be behavior because that's under my control. The effectiveness, if you drive slowly, is going to be, reliable and then who is accountable well it's me so it will be myself so i'm the hsc manager for just for argument's sake so when i do this you see now i've got a barrier there which is showing me that it's a behavior barrier i will drive slowly and it'll be reliable uh, i clicked on the wrong one there sorry uh, for HSC manager. Yeah. Now let's look at bad driving. What can you have against bad driving? Hoting from the wrong side. Well, a theoretical could be follow the 
traffic rules. Yeah, if you follow the traffic yeah. rules, then you'll not overtake from the wrong side. Now, what kind of type of barrier will I define this as? So if I go into the software, uh, it will be behavior, or it could be, yeah, it's behavior. And the effectiveness is, again, I'm going to be say fairly reliable. It won't be very reliable, fairly reliable. And again, it will be me as HSC manager doing that. So now you see that. Lack of maintenance. Now that barrier for that is fairly straightforward. You follow so the maintenance is again, a socio-technical thing because it's uh, something hardware that you do, do maintenance on your vehicle and effectiveness is going to be reliable because if you maintain your car, your brakes will not fail. If you maintain your motorbike brakes, it won't fail. If you service it regularly and make sure and test them before you set off, etc., all those good things. And then I can ask my maintenance authority to look after my car. So now you see there's a barrier. Oh, uh, need to know, name it. Within the car. Please forgive my typing mistakes. My mind thinks a bit faster than my fingers. But this software has got built in uh, spell checker, which I can use afterwards to make it correct. Against potholes, what you can do is you can uh, request request uh, the local new Nisi Palti Palti. I'll correct the spelling to repair the potholes. Now that barrier you can request, but they will only do, that would be again socio technical. You request them and they might come and do the work or they might not do the work depending on how much money they've got left in the budget, etc. The effectiveness would be, I would say, unreliable because they might not do the work. And again, this would be then third party, I would say. So let's say design corporate social function, just for argument's sake. When we come to do the actual ambassador case study, I've got more relevant job title. So now you see what's happening here is we are building barriers, control risk control barriers on the left hand side so these are preventive ones so if this one works and it's a, we are saying it's a reliable one what it will do is it will st stop going into the loss of control stop having the accidents so these are known as preventive barriers any any issues so far well okay so against a minor accident what mitigation you can have? You got a minor attention, you can have first aid. First aid or attendance by the ambulance. Maybe not for minor accident. Now that one is going to be a behavior thing. And then effectiveness is going to be, yeah, ambulance would be maybe fairly reliable it depends on how much traffic is there at the time of the day and how many ambulances will turn up and whether they are good enough and the accountable would be maybe we'll just call it corporate social because we don't got anything in that so now you can see we are building up controls on the other side so you had an accident but how can you recover from it so these are known as recovery or they're known as mitigatory against car fire what is uh, that you can have? So if I say against car fire, I can have fire brigade. Firefighting equipment. Yeah, firefighting equipment. Yeah, that's a good one. I'll put that one in. Equipment. And then uh, that would be actually uh, hardware because you're using uh, the right type of extinguisher in the right manner. The effect is would be very, maybe reliable. I never give very reliable, by the way. And that would be maybe yourself. You, you got a fire extinguisher in the back of your car or the fire brigade has got one. So you can call it 
just call it there for argument's sake. So now you can see I'm trying to build up a picture where I've got something in place if I have this last action. I've had, I've, all my preventive barriers have failed and now I'm going towards the consequence there. But then I've got these barriers in place. So when I've done this, and I'm going to show this because this, this was just to sort of get you into the thinking mode of a bow tie looks like. So I hope this has made you aware of the, how simple and how reliable a process this is. So now we'll move on to the, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute while I go back to the presentation and give you the case study. So just bear with me, I'm going to stop sharing it for a while and I'll move on to my presentation. Okay, so Lekar sir, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Uh, this is a Google photograph from Ambazari Lake. I've not been there personally to take the photograph, so depends on yes. that quality. So that's your Ambazari Lake, beautiful piece of water. And I remember it used to flood in monsoons every year when I was there. I don't know if it does it now. So what we have here is, A new site that you guys, you clever boys and girls of chemical engineers, future LIT, are asked to design a liquid chemicals bulk storage and blending facility just next to the lake. You got two by four above ground mild steel tanks within two separate concrete burns. And I'll explain the term burns to you in the next couple of slides because uh, I don't think you might be familiar with it at this stage in your careers. But if you are, then forgive me for repeating it. Now each tank has a capacity of 5,000 meter cube. So that's roughly 50 million liters. So these, these are giant tanks. And the burns are sized to government regulations. So what, what are government regulations? Well, within Europe, uh, the government regulation is if you got a tank containing hazardous liquid, which is either flammable, toxic, corrosive, or all three. And if you got a burn, the burn should be designed to contain 110% of the largest tank. So as a designer, you will work out what's 110% of 5,000 meter cube. My burn should contain that. Okay, not both the tanks, but not all the four tanks, but at least one, 110%. So that's a design standard. Uh, and furthermore, I'm making life easy for you guys. I'm saying the chemicals are compatible and won't react because that is a different scenario. If they were not compatible as a designer, it would raise alarm bells in your minds. You'll not design a tank a burn, tank farm with two incompatible uh, tanks in the same burn because heaven forbid, if both were to lose containment, you could have a, a nasty scenario very toxic chemical release or a fire or an explosion. Okay. So this, if you can see my mouse, where number three is, is a bund. Number four is a bund. What, what the bund does is, say the worst happens and your tank loses containment, primary containment. The tank is your primary containment. It's a steel tank into which the liquid is sitting. And if you lose that, this concrete burn is lined to stop the liquid spreading further. Now, I don't know about the Indian regulations about chemical factory layout and etc. but as part of your curriculum, you might be able to look it up. If the burn was also to fail, then there's something called this number five, that's known as a tertiary containment. So this is like a, uh, everything is then designed to flow. Anything you lose from say tank farm number one or tank number 12 uh, or from anywhere else, will go slope via the drains into number five. 
that's known as tertiary containment. And that has to be designed taking into capacity of the worst case scenario you can think of. And over here, you see a little drain going into the local Ambazari Lake. So this is what we are talking about. We got these four tanks here. Yeah. Now the bulk chemicals come to these tanks via so road tankers from Mumbai terminal. So we're assuming it's a petrochemical product. And so the flash point of 30 degrees. And it's also environmentally toxic. So it's not corrosive, it's not toxic to people, but it's toxic to the waters and the soil. So if you were to lose this chemical in the Ambazari Lake, then any fish or marine life there will be affected. It will be affected. Then the side drains are split into two types of drains. One is the surface drain. So that takes all the water that comes in to the lake via the interceptor. The interceptor is another chemical unit which separates out oil and water based on difference in specific gravity. And foul drains, which then goes to the sewage treatment plant and then into the water authority, the permit. And I'm sure that uh, the regulations are quite specific for chemical factories where you can discharge your product, not need rivers or lakes, otherwise you will make them toxic and uh, people will be affected, the health will be affected. Now, I'm, further I'm saying that in this beautiful new tank farm that you're designing, there's no firefighting provision. So there's no sprinklers on the tanks if there's a fire, because it's very expensive. In real life, you, you can have so much safety that uh, it's not profitable at all. So there's no point. It's always a fine tightrope balance of cost versus benefit. And that is true even in European or American or Australian or anywhere you go in the world. You can design a system which is reasonably safe. So on one hand, you balance the cost of stopping an accident against the cost of running your operations. And how much harm it will cause. So if the cost of uh, doing something to prevent an accident is not very high, then you are expected to do that. But if the cost of preventing pollution is so high, but the benefit is very little, then you don't have to do that. And that depends on individual countries' approach to pollution and the societal expectations. And I, I'm sure within India, there is a very high expectation against environmental pollution nowadays. They might not have been 50 years ago, but this certainly is now. So I'm saying there's no firefighting provision. What happens is that if there's a fire on site, the fire brigade is called, dialing 100, 999 or whatever the system is in India. And the fire brigade will come and put the fire out for you. The site is operating from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. in two shift patterns, Monday to Friday, and nothing, no working on Saturday, Sunday, happy days. There is a CCTV monitoring by external third party. We'll call out the on-call duty manager. If they think there is something wrong going on, if they see people uh, trying to climb into your bund and trying to steal your product, they will then call you, call the duty manager, who will come and then sort it out. So now we're gonna do the most exciting part, which is conducting the bow tie. So these are the steps before I take you back into the bow tie screen. You need to identify the hazard, the top event, threats, barriers, and consequences. So in this case, because we are limited for time, what I've done is I've given you the hazard, the top event, and I've listed the threats and the barriers. It's not an exhaustive list, there can be many more. But just to keep it simple, and because it's a new topic, more or less for you guys and girls, I'm starting this way. Keep it slow and steady. Secondly, we are assuming the top event for this study is loss of containment. Thirdly, we are going to identify this. Then what we have to discuss is the possible preventive barriers and escalation factors. So prevention on the LHS is left hand side. So we are talking about risk controls for stopping the threats moving on to the other side, and then recovery or mitigatory barriers and escalation factors on the right-hand side. So that is mitigation. 
the worst thing that could happen has happened. So how do you recover from the situation? How am I doing so far? Are you still all alive and kicking? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Good. Go ahead. I've not lost anyone so far. Yeah. So I'm going to give you this. This this is as I said, it's not an exhaustive list. We'll look at your wonderful new tank farm. We'll look at the traits of internal corrosion. We'll look at overfilling. We'll look at lack of maintenance. And we look at asset impact by site vehicle. What I mean by that is, if you have a tank which is not protected by a bund, say it's just lying on, next to the roadside, and your tanker is coming on the side to fill the tank in, uh, and for some reason the driver loses control, his brakes fail, the tank goes and hits the vehicle, the, the vehicle loses control and hits the tank, then the tank might break open and lose whatever is contained inside. So that, that's what I mean by asset impact by site vehicle. On the other side, consequences, I'm just identifying for you, this is four. One is major accident to the environment. In short, I call it MATI, major accident to the environment. So that is your Ambazari Lake being severely polluted. If Ambazari Lake is used for drinking water supply, can you imagine what will happen? The local government officer will have to declare an emergency. It will have to publicly broadcast on television and local radio to the residents living near uh, who, who are supplied by Ambassador water. Don't drink the water. So who will bear the cost? It will be your employer. So boys and girls try not to do this. Then you, the second factor and which is very, uh, very, very real as well, you lose reputation. And there'll be regular direction. There, there could be people turning up from, say, Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace or whatever local equivalent is in NGOs who care for environment. They will turn up at your factory and try and shut you down. As serious as that. There will certainly be claims and increase in insurance costs. No insurance company would want to uh, give you insurance protection against an accident if you cause a major accident. Or if they do, then they'll charge you three times the money. And of course, never forget the human element. There could be a serious accident to the person or persons. Uh, and as I've said, th these are just four I picked at random. There can be many more. And the clever thing will be after this session for you to write this down and send it to Joglicker, sir. See how many more you can identify. As it is, we are limited for time. We've already gone over one hour, 10 minutes. A full workshop, which I usually coordinate at my workplace is six to eight hours per bow tie. And in a typical factory environment, you can have two or three bow ties. For example, you can bow tie for the danger or the hazard of storing the product. You can have a bow tie for road tanker movements on site. You can have a bow tie for ship to shore transfer like in the video you show uh, we get uh, a ship come in from say Saudi Arabia with crude oil and then that is being then offloaded uh, and it contains so much material that no, not a single tank can fill it in so then it's filled into one tank and then there's a, a dynamic switch to a second tank and so on and so forth yeah so th those sort of things take six to eight hours but fortunately for you I will only talk for an hour and a half now to solve the example. Now, if this was face to face, we will discuss and list two barriers, per threat and two consequences, the barriers. The former, as I've said, on the left-hand side, whatever is there against the blue color threats are known as preventive barriers. And the ones on the right-hand side against the red color consequences are the mitigative barriers. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing that just because these are important points. Because it's a new topic for you guys and girls, I want to go a bit slow and gentle on you this time round. Then, when we have completed the bow tie today, I'll send it to Dr. Saurabh Joglekar and he will hopefully and kindly pass it on to all the attendees. So, you have something to remember. So, now the next stage is live working with the bow tie software. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to the other things, I'll stop sharing my screen for a minute. 
and go to the bow tie for our case study. Sorabji, give me a shout if you can see see the next bow tie now. Sir, we are seeing product storage, yeah. Loss of content. Okay. You can see. Good. So now I'm going to just expand it. So as I explained to you, we'll be storing product and this lovely new designed bulk tanks inside a concrete burn next to Ambazari Lake. Now we are trying to see the effect of various things whilst designing. Not whilst operating, we're think, thinking while designing. Once you have designed it rightly, then we also think about the operations factors in the same bow tie. So against internal corrosion, what are the typical things which will cause corrosion of mild steel? One would be the product itself. If the product is caustic or acidic, it will cause corrosion. So in that case, you would not design it with mild steel. You might design it with maybe fiber reinforced plastic. You might design it with as stainless steel, perhaps. Okay, so that's internal corrosion. Overfilling, so the tanker has come in, but like in that, chemical safety board video you show, uh, show earlier of filling blind, uh, your gauge might not be working. So you think you can fit a, three tankers in, but it can only fill in two tankers, but your gauge is stuck because of various reasons. So you might overfill the product. And then it's a brand new facility. So why would you think of maintenance? Well, prevention is better than cure, as they say. So you should think of when you're designing equipment, think about what maintenance is required. You are actually expected as a chemical engineer to specify to the maintenance department of wherever you will be working in future, what maintenance is required. So you might say, my tank requires full emptying and internal inspection and uh, measuring the thickness of the mild steel walls for every seven years. So, so then what the operations manager will do is he will schedule maintenance once every seven years on one tank at a time. So he doesn't lose production capacity. He can still carry on and he can still be reassured that his tank is not corroded. And then, as I mentioned, asset impact by site vehicle. So if you are designing a bulk tank, think about how high your pipelines are going to be. that will be feeding the tanks. If they're at a low level, then you got every chance of things banging against it and damaging it and losing control, containment from the pipeline, but it's filling, okay? So, and if you think you will be clever and you put your pipeline underground whilst you are designing this new facility right into the tank burn, then think if the pipeline is underground, how will you make sure that it's not leaking from flanges or fittings? So there's lots to consider. The other side is fairly straightforward. If you lose containment for whatever, whichever threat here, one of these four tanks, four threats, you've got your risk control measures, which we'll identify now have failed. You can lead to pollution, you can lead to fire, prosecution, or serious injury. Okay, so starting with internal corrosion, let's look at the first barrier. So I'm going to define against internal corrosion. I can, I can very nicely say, because this is your specialty, isn't it? Design standard, specific to the product to be stored. Do you agree that this, this would be a good way of preventing internal corrosion? You design your equipment, your bulk tank with the right type of material of construction and to the right international code. So let's try and read this. So if I try to read this now, I'm saying and in this description, you can then put in whatever the standard is. For example, if it's designed to international standard XXXXX, you can put that in. And why you put this data in, I'll show you when we have finished the bow tie, this software can generate a report. Now you might be wondering, 
why should I use such an expensive software? It costs something like 2,000 pounds. So that's roughly about 20,000 rupees a year. Why would I invest in software? Can I not do it any other way? And of course, we Indians love cheap bargains, don't we? So yeah, you can do it other way. Very easy to do that. Follow the same principle. Use post-it notes on the wall of your factory or your office. And you can put stickers up with colors, left and side, right and side, top and central. Nothing stopping you do that. And there is no harm. It's not substandard. It's only as good as the input you give it. So having said that, now design standard is going to be socio-technical. Why socio-technical? Because it's a technical standard that you're going to follow. And it will be built by people to that standard. So that's it's input with human element. That's you, your brains, your skills, your experience, your training, and the standard which has been sort of developed by international committee of experts. Okay, so when it's such a good thing, the effectiveness is going to be reliable. Never give very reliable because never say everything is fine because you never know. The accountable would be now here would be the design authority. Let's see what this period looks like. So this design authority is nice and green. And it this port I now gives you more information. Against internal corrosion, I've got a design standard which has been implemented as a socio-technical risk control measure. It's very reliable, I believe. And remember, in real life, when you do a bow tie, you're not on your own. If you are at the design stage, you should involve the maintenance engineers, mechanical engineers. You should involve the electrical engineers, instrumentation engineers, and so on. And you must always also have an experienced shop floor operator. There's real value in the English because very early in my career, when I did my first port, I, I didn't have maintenance guys in my workshop. And when I'd done it and then I ran it past uh, my bosses, they said, you got no input from mechanical or electrical engineers. So this is not good enough. Go back and do it again. And that's how I learned the hard way. You have to involve the right people right from the beginning. Never try and do it on your own. Never be afraid to ask the questions. Never be afraid to ask very simple questions either. Yeah, it doesn't show that you're ignorant. It shows that you're keen. It shows that you're, you have an open mind. It shows that you're not prejudiced. Important skill to learn as chemical engineers. Okay, let's look at then a second barrier against internal corrosion. I would say this would be maybe some sort of coating inspection. Yeah, internal coating, which is uh, so this, let's now break it down, internal coating, yeah. And then you can put in down, say, epoxy two-pack coating with specified chemical, don't worry about typos, I'll correct them before I send it to you, chemical resistance. Now this barrier would be of a passive hardware because it's not actually doing anything, but it is stopping the corrosion becoming so worse. So it's a passive hardware and effectiveness is going to be re, uh, reliable because it's always there. It's always there, it's always present. And who will be doing the internal coating? It could be the supplier or it could be the design authority, it could be engineering manager, whoever, let's say engineering manager or maintenance of the part manufacturer. Yeah, that's correct. So when you have the people supplying the tanks, you can specify, I want this epoxy two-pack coating on there to make it resistant. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Saurabhji. That, that's an excellent call. Yeah. Now let's look at overfilling. And why am I doing it this way, not the other way around? Because 
if you know what the threats are, it's easier to predict your pollution and sometimes you can link. And also not be worried about which one is leading to which one. It can be any. And the idea is to be clever enough to predict everything. Overfilling. So against overfill, you can have automatic level controller. And then you can define this like a, it's a safety integrity level two functional safety. Now these are the terms I would uh, sort of encourage you to look up. What's a seal? What's a safety integrity level? because this is an international standard, which I mentioned in my references, so you can look it up afterwards. Uh, what it means is that your level controller is designed to a, uh, such a standard that if it hits the level, it will be set at two different levels. First one will be known as a high level alarm. So it will just alarm and tell the operator, go on, get in, get in there and stop the filling of the tank because something is not right. Yeah, then it will have a high high where it's now no longer relying on the operator to do anything. It will just shut off the transfer pump, which is filling the uh, tank, automatic shut off. So this type of barrier would be active hardware. Why is it active? Because it detects something, it does something without the operator having to do his, his bit. And this, uh, because this is seal level two, it's highly reliable. And who is responsible? This would be the production manager, plant production manager. Yeah, there you go. Or it would no, it won't be the manager, it will be the operatives themselves. But who looks after this system? And that would be the maintenance. Because maintenance authority will control this. So let's see what it looks like. Yeah. So this is one of the most common design factors against prevention of overfilling. So when you, when you, you are not going to just rely on operators. So you might argue this will cost a bit, won't it? Yeah, it will. But then you look at the consequences and weigh the consequences. Do you want your factory shut down? Do you want people to come and burn your factory down because you cause severe pollution of a sensitive receptor like Ambazari? No, you don't. So it's worth investing in this. The second one could be Without much cost, it could be operating procedure. And I'll add the word safe operating procedures. So this barrier would be behavior. Effectiveness would be sort of fairly reliable, not 100%. And accountable would be uh, production operate. Where is the operating one? production of operatives. Now I'll explain a bit about the safe operating procedure. What it means is when you design the equipment, think about how the equipment is to be operated and what should an operator do to prevent overfilling. So your safe operating procedure could be as simple as three lines saying, check the existing level, check what the capacity of the tanker is that you're going to fill the tank with and then do not proceed if there is any doubt that's your safe operating procedure so it's fairly reliable as long as your operators understand that and you as the design authority or chemical engineers you will be involved in this in your day-to-day -day life because people will look up to you and say master show me how to prevent overfill, how to fill the tank in a safe manner. And this is where your skills as engineers, your training, your experience as you go along in life will come in, okay? Lack of maintenance. Remember, we are talking about threats and how we can prevent them. These, these are our risk control barriers. So lack of maintenance would be PPM. 
So what's PPM? It's not parts per million, but it is, I'll make it easy. Plant preventive maintenance. I'll correct the spelling mistakes afterwards. So this would be a socio-technical thing because it will depend on the maintenance guys going around and doing the critical maintenance. Effectiveness is fairly reliable in my experience and this would be the maintenance uh, authority. So let me explain what preventive, plant preventive maintenance is. Oops. Typo there. What this stands for is that you look at a design specification. This is my mild steel. And to maintain my mild steel, I must look at external corrosion and I must look at internal corrosion. To look at internal corrosion, every seven years I'll empty the tank, I'll put people inside because it's a huge. 5,000 meter cube tank. They will go in with breathing apparatus in a confined space using a safe manner. They'll measure the thickness of the metal and compare it with the original construction material. So for example, if it, the tank was designed with six millimeter thickness to start off, it will have a corrosion uh, allowance, which, you, uh, which will be specified in the design standard and which you as uh, uh, designing chemical engineers are expected to specify. You, you can then say, okay, every 10 years, a corrosion allowance is one millimeter. But when it reaches four millimeters from six or eight millimeters, then the tank should be either recoated or it should be dis uh, disconnected and replaced. So that, that is what plant preventive maintenance looks like. In plant preventive maintenance, you'll take a tank out and then you'll do that. So what can be another Barrier against lack of means. So this could be competent, competent and trained maintenance staff. So this again is behavior because it's very much depending on the training and their attitude to work. The effect of this will say fairly reliable because they can make mistakes. And again, the responsibility for having competent uh, maintenance would be maintenance authority. So when you look at this, you can see some, some barriers are pretty reliable, green. Some are not. And especially when there is people involved, your operators, your shop floor attendants, who are going to be looking after your equipment, uh, you have to pay special attention because that's where accidents and incidents go wrong. Against asset impact. So here, this is fairly straightforward. You can say the concrete bund. So what's happening is by putting your tanks inside a concrete bund, you are stopping a crazy tanker driver driving into it. If you go and hit the concrete, but it won't damage your tank. Hopefully we say, because you never know nowadays. So this would be actually passive hardware. And then effectiveness is gonna be pretty good because you hit a concrete burn, your asset is still protected. And the accountable would be maintenance guys to, it could be the production foreman. He looks at the burn and makes sure that the burn is not breaking away. It's not in bits. It's not been hit by other vehicles time after time because of poor driving or poor discipline on site. And then you can also think of another one. Uh, let's say pipelines about four meters. So what you've done now is you actually taken, so this would be passive hardware. So your pipelines that go from the road tanker into the bun are so high that no one can hit it unless it's a flying plane. Now against that, you you got no defense. So this would be a 
passive hardware. Effectiveness would be pretty reliable because it's way up in the air, so a, a tanker on the road or a motorcyclist can't accidentally run into it. And this would be again design authority. You will be designing it, and you will be actually putting your pipeline up there. How are we doing so far? Take a moment to think what we have done so far in the case study. And what I'll do is just make the fonts a bit bigger so it's easy to read. Is that better? Looks uh, more visible. What we have done so far is we've identified risk control measures that will prevent the threats in blue going to the consequences in red. So these are your risk control measures. This is what a bow tie enables you to do. As we have seen previously in a common example like car accident, your threats are poor weather or bad driving, etc. And then you have controls like drive slowly, follow traffic rules, and then the consequences will not be realized. But if, if you have an accident, if your car is on fire, fire brigade can attend and put the fire out, or people can help you, or ambulance can turn up, etc. So against pollution, what sort of barriers can you design? So what you can design is you have a pill response procedure. So this would be something which is socio-technical. So you have a procedure and you then get people to clean up the mess that's uh, growing and that because it relies on people will be fairly reliable. And this would be actually the operatives, production operatives will be responsible. So what I've done here is you got a pollution incident going on. It just started. And fortunately it's during working hours. It's not over a weekend when there's no one in the factory, then it's too late. So you can have people trained to do certain things in a certain sequence. You can have people trained to go and shut off walls which lead to Ambazari Lake, for example. The, the, it's not a really good measure, but it's a measure. But the better measure would be automatic interceptor cutoff. And I'll explain this in a second, what's an interceptor, etc. This would be an active hardware and it would be reliable. And this would be again maintained by the maintenance people. So if we say maintenance authority. So what an interceptor does is it separates water and your product, say if it's petroleum, by gravity and it has a pump that feeds it from from there whatever the water is skimmed off whatever water is there in the interceptor it's detected by a probe, a probe and a level controller and then that is cut off the moment it detects any pollution in there so nothing then leaves your site that's a fairly good measure and that's the measure which is quite normal in a good factory so as, as, as you design your tanks, you need to start thinking about all these nasty things that can happen or go wrong if the equipment is not correctly used or if it breaks down. And then you can also design these things. So all things you said to me at cost, but then it's the perspective. Is that cost reasonable? Is it expected of you? Is the government's inspector telling you, you will not pollute my ambassador relay? Are the people, the residents of Nagpur telling you, you will not pollute my ambassador lake. And if that is the fact, then you will have to design these things in. Against the fire, let's think of against the fire, you can have fire brigade response. What happens when there's a big tank containing flammable liquid on fire? How is it put out? What the fire brigade do is, and for you, it's lucky you're next to Ambazari Lake, so there's lots of water. They'll connect up their fire pumps, take the water from the lake, and put it on your tanks to cool them down. Cool the tanks down so they don't go into 
uh, a very serious scenario where you'll have a vapor cloud generated. By the way, if you are interested, do look up YouTube for Chemical Safety Board USA. It has got excellent videos on safety, safe design. It's got loads of actual accidents from which you can learn. I would strongly recommend you do that. I've not put it in my references, but maybe I will change the slide and pass it on to Joglikar sir. So fire brigade response. So the fire brigade is a, is a pretty reliable thing. The barrier category is going to be socio-technical because it won't do it on its own. You have to call the fire brigade saying, please sir, come and put my fires out. The value is, you'll say, reliable because they, they, they are trained to put fires out. And this would be then, a, it was the responsibility of a production manager to call the fire brigade, have it work. Okay, other thing, in this design, we assume there is no automatic fire. So we can put the words like, fire alarm and detection. So what that will do is if there is a fire anywhere on site, operator will raise the alarm and call the fire brigade. So it doesn't actually stop the fire from happening, but you know as soon as the fire has happen, ha happened on your site. And this again would be the poor production guy looking after it on day to day. So you got a response from the fire brigade, which is reliable, and you got uh, production operatives who will then call the fire brigade. Against prosecution, ha, huh. that's, that's a difficult one. What can you do to stop prosecution? You can have a good relationship Sip and frequent emergency exercises. So what this means is you call your local fire brigade or your local emergency council officers to your site, tell them, show them your system, be honest with them, show them your system and say, these are the things that can go wrong. These are the things I have in place. And then you can arrange a tabletop exercise or an on-site exercise where you talk through this with an operator who's never looked at the port eyes and then see if they understand, if people who are responsible for these risk control measures understand what they're dealing with and how, they, how confident they are to deal with it. So this barrier, it won't stop is more of a behavior type thing. Uh, effectiveness is reliable. Is that a 20 minute warning for me, Joglikar sir? Right, so what do you see here? Sorry? The phone rang, apologies for that. Oh, no worries. I thought it's, you're trying to rob make me rush because we've got only 20 minutes left. Time passes when you have fun. So here, I'm just gonna then list one. The other one would be, I mean, if, the, if there's a serious pollution, then having good relationship is not going to be very effective anyway. But it will sort of count in your favor in a court of law when the judge sits down and say, Mr. Ambassador Factory, I'm going to fine you 20 crore rupees, which will probably put you out of business. So this one would be have good insurance. So you can pay for the cost of prostitution and you can get the expert saying, uh, so this one will be, this will be passive behavior. You got it in the background. If something goes wrong and I'm being prosecuted, uh, it will be fairly reliable because no one can say what a court of law would do. And this will be the managing director responsible for making sure that you have good insurance. So now to go through a serious injury, let's consider. 
uh, you can have uh, emergency rescue by ambulance. So this would be socio-technical. Someone will have to call the ambulance and it would be fairly reliable because it depends on how soon the ambulance arrives, etc. And this would be probably the responsibility of the production manager. Okay. The other one against serious energy, uh, injury could be what's very much in thing in vogue now because of coronavirus. Personal protective equipment. So what I mean by this is, say, hard hat. So if someone drops uh, something from top of a tank while taking, uh, checking level gauges, uh, say the mechanic drops a, drops a spanner, which is coming up from this great big tank, it can actually kill a person. But if the person is wearing a hard hat, then at least the possibility is reduced. It's not eliminated, but it's reduced. So that's, and that would be sort of social, that would be behavior, that people wear the right PP, is designed correctly. And I would say it's unreliable. It won't stop serious injury sometimes. And this would be the operatives themselves. So here we now have a completed bow tie. I'm sorry I had to rush through this because we didn't have enough time. As I said, this takes much time. So what I'm now going to very quickly show you is how to run a report. So you go into the tools, where you can do a spell check as well, which I'll do afterwards. But we'll, we'll run a report. And I'm going to run a barrier register. Okay. So this will now generate a spreadsheet. Just give us a shot that you can see it when you see it, please. Is the spreadsheet visible? Yeah, uh, since the font size is small. Okay, I'll make it bigger. Yeah? Yeah. Is that better? Yes, yeah. I'll send a copy of this anyway. So on here, you have the automatic level controller defined in row two. That's your barrier, it says so. And then this report then tells me it's an active hardware. It tells me it's reliable and it tells me who is accountable. So I can play with the spreadsheet, which I will do before I send it to you as a finished article. Just to very quickly show you that now you have a list of what your risk controls are. You have a list of who is maintaining it. You have a list or an estimate of how reliable it is or unreliable. And you also know what type of barrier it is. Is it active, is it passive, is it behavior, is it socio-technical, whichever one you classified it as. Okie dokie. So now I'm going to pause sharing my screen. As I said, I'll send you a copy of all these. So don't worry about that. I'm going to pause the, this and go back to my final slide. So we'll finish off. So Glicker, sir, can you see my presentation again now, please? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, so there we go. We've done that. So these are the references which I said I'll provide you. I'll just put them up all in one go because we are now running really short of time. The first reference tells you how to design a bulk fuel storage guidance. I mean, this is applicable to obviously European and UK standard, but you will hopefully have something similar in India. What this does is, even if you don't follow it word by word, it gives you an idea of what to consider. And it's a very good document. And you can download a free copy from that website. The second one is for you design gurus, technical systems unit guidance. So when you look at look up this reference, what you'll see is that is, uh, for equipment, what are the things which the regulator will look at? It will look at asset life, look at asset integrity, it will look at maintenance regimes. And similar, next one will give you the technical measures. As I said, 
I haven't got anything which is relevant to India, but this gives you an idea of what, what sort of things might be available. Then the CG risks, the people who, who designed the software, they've got loads of examples. You, you follow this example, you don't even need me to tell you how to work with them. Thing. Then the American Chemical Institute, they've got different books which uh, might be useful in the library of LIT if you go for training on Porta XP. Otherwise, wherever you work, they might have your own works library in future, and that will be a good reference for you. There's a brief reference which I could find on the internet about chemical regulations in India, which I would definitely ask you to look at, especially the final year students, because it will help you in it, in your future interviews. If if you know something about regulations, which your employer might be pleasantly surprised with, then you got process safety webinars by ABB, and then you got Energy Institute guidance on different processes. So I hope you find that useful. And then you got functional safety, which I mentioned. You can look it up over there. So before I go, any questions that might come to you after the webinar, please route them to me via Dr. Saurabh Joglekar. I'll try to answer this in due course. And like uh, in Karorpati, Amitabh Bachchan says, if I don't know the answer, I'll phone a friend. I'll appreciate your feedback on this session uh, via Dr. Joglekar. And any suggestions are welcome. Good luck and goodbye. Thank you for listening. So the three key things I would like you to take away is use this technique for qualitative risk assessment at your work when you come to working lives. Always involve operators, safety and maintenance staff. Never ever try to do it in isolation. Share the responsibility because as they say, two minds are better than one. And never get bogged down with minutia of risk ranking. Is it fairly good or or good, fairly reliable, unreliable. That doesn't matter. The th key thing is you, you know what your threats are, what your consequences are and controls are. So finally, again, I wish to thank Dr. Saru Joglekar and Dr. Raju Mankar for permitting me to conduct the workshop. And I wish to acknowledge training materials. Jai Hen. Over to you, Dr. Joglekar, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, it is indeed great learning. Uh, because uh, for a thing which is as simple as a uh, uh, tank. Kind of software itself, we are able to gauge what kind of risk we are looking at whenever we are designing. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a specific uh, tool to gauge risk uh, in our equipment design course, but we would be fairly working on it and including the same into our course curriculum for the benefits of the students. Uh, if you have got any questions, uh, you can please ask me. I can direct it to sir. Uh, sir, I have, I have got a very specific question. Uh, yeah. What after uh, graduation? Suppose if I'm graduating this year and I want to make a career in my uh, in process safety. I want to yeah. practice as a process safety engineer. So are there any prerequisites that are uh, necessary? And if, if they are, from where can I get such kind of a, uh, assessment or certification done? Okay. Uh, the American website, which I've mentioned, AI Chemi, Chemical Center for Process. Just to give you a taste of it, what you can do is if you search uh, process safety courses online, you'll see loads of providers. There's also a provider in India, I think ABP Engineering. 
It's a giant international company and they do a lot of process safety awareness courses as well as process safety uh, certifi certified courses. They are quite expensive, but maybe in India they might not be so expensive. And if you look up the syllabus, because that is on the net, you can understand what goes into a pro becoming a process safety engineer. As young chemical engineers of future, what I have to say to you might sound a bit painful, but what I have yeah. to say to you is, it's not just simply enough to be a good technically qualified chemical engineer. You need other skills to progress in your career. Skills like project management, skills, skills like process safety, screen uh, skills like management because i learned in my first project which uh, when i was asked to put up a factory in baroda uh, the contractors were running rings around me because i was not experienced in project management they were doing things and adding costs without my realizing and so in the end i got fed up and i did a little course certificate in industrial management with ms university in baroda and that helped me a lot figure out why these guys are crooks and then I fired them and got a new crew in and got the project done in time, in full. So, so management and other uh, things, soft skills, how to manage people, how to be a good supervisor, because as chemical engineers, you'd most probably go in at a supervisor level, not at a factory workshop level. So how to deal with people, how to be humble, and how to get best of your colleagues and your superiors is, is equally important. I think when I studied my BSc Tech, there was a module in final year on industrial management, and I found it very useful. So don't treat that because it's not technical as a subclass module. It is a module that prepares you for your life. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, what I'm thinking right now is uh, I'll just share the free trial version of the software and try to include the same in your course curriculum and because once the students start uh, working on it they might uh, come up with some different doubts uh, which we can uh, address on later uh, okay there's a question yeah uh, uh, the attendee asked that uh, if there is a accident in plant Generally, any, any accident is caused due to many reasons, and it happens in seconds. So, how bow tie analysis helps in this, and is there any alarm virtually that we can set up in our software? Uh, not within the software, but the, the way the software works, it's, it's uh, preventive. It can be used as a reactive tool after the accident to investigate which barriers failed, and you can trace what failed. But the clever part is, if the bow tie risk analysis is done in a proper uh, structured manner and with the right people in the team, then you know what your weak points are. So as a company, you try and concentrate in maintaining those risk barriers. That's how a bow tie is helpful. It, it will, the bow tie at the end of the day is a software or is a, is a way of working, is a way of predicting. But in real life, only things like functional safety instruments, which are well maintained, well designed, and correctly sized relief vents, and those sort of things will help you. If you look at uh, what might be interesting would be for your students to have a go at uh, Visakhapatnam as a case study. Yeah. Take a tank which contains styrene. So look up what are the hazards of styrene. Is it flammable? Is it toxic? Is it explosive? And then uh, use the same sort of structure which I've given you product of hazardous products of so your product hazard is your storage of styrene. Loss of control is loss of containment from a tank. And then, which you can do to sort of recover from it. I'm sorry if it does affect anyone's personal lives. I'm really sorry, but it is an event that's happened and it's in public domain. Yeah, it is best that if we discuss on it so that uh, such kind of events won't happen in the future. Yeah. So, as a safety uh, professional, sorry, as a safety professional, I've become very negative. Even when I, I am such, such a sad case, when I go to see a cinema, the first thing I try to look is where is the fire exit? Is it blocked? Rather than enjoy the film, it's a sad case, right. but it helps in the professional life. 
uh, another question from one of the attendees yes. Isha Dutta uh, she asked about how we will know that a particular bota analysis is enough or not basically she is uh, trying to ask about the scope I mean hmm. whatever analysis that we have done how we are able to understand that this thing is sufficient to define our particular system yeah that's a, that's a very good uh, question I didn't cover it in the beginning uh, the scope of the bow tie should be defined y you as a team ask yourselves what is it that I'm trying to stop happening and that defines your scope parameter and the other thing with the bow tie could be an, and I'm equally guilty of doing that is you get down to very minute details bow tie is not the right tool for that bow tie is to look at overall picture so you cannot go to the last steps so for example in a boat i have said you will have an automatic level controller which will shut off these incoming walls then if you then try to break it down into what are those elements what do i need etc then a bow tie is not the right tool for that to do that you need something like hazop which is which is yeah. which is a lot more powerful tool than a boat tie so bow tie is qualitative to define the scope as the student has asked it is very good it is very critical because if you don't define what your scope is you could then do things which are not really fruitful they don't add value to your time and your money uh, sir at what stage uh, bota analysis is actually done is it in the designing stage of the entire uh, system process or once the whole system is set then we have to modify it as per uh, the safety standard of that particular area i mean at what uh, time interval this boat analysis is done yeah uh, okay that's a good question uh, typically when you are designing a facility you don't do a bow tie you do something like a hazop so bow tie is not the right technique at the design stage where bow tie comes in handy is once the plant is ready and starts working in real life that's when you do that to identify what can go wrong etc i try to give you a few examples of what i related to equipment uh, that is just to sort of make you aware that the possibility is there but i would not use it as a, as the only tool to design equipment to design an equipment or a process uh, you you need more detailed studies like layer of protection analysis and your bow tie and in fact layer of protection analysis and bow ties are related because in your layer of protection analysis, your preventive barriers are your first, second, and third layers of protection, as you see. And in a layer of protection analysis, what you do is then you assign values to it. How reliable is it? And then you go into more details. So BOTA is like an intermediate step to conducting low. And you'll find that the terms that you come up in layers of protection analysis, uh, your preventive barriers and your mitigative barriers are the same as those identified in BOTA. So yeah, you can do one as a as a design stage, but in real life, you you will find people who do the actual equipment design in professional lives, they will not use bow tie as a as a tool. It's a helpful tool to learn the skills, but it's more helpful. Bow tie is absolutely uh, critical once the plant is operational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was another question on layer of protection analysis. You already yeah. answered. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions that uh, that the attendees want to ask? As I said, if it yeah. comes to people afterwards, uh, I'm happy to take them sure. offline. Yeah, sure. So if you have got any specific questions that you uh, might arise once we start working on it, please feel free to share it with me. I can transfer it to Richard. And uh, thanks a lot. Thank you and all the best to all my lovely students out there and to yeah. you. LIT uh, community are doing well. Carry on the good work. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Bhanasi, sir, uh, if you want to add something at the end. Hello? Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Yes. yes, sir, you are audible. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear uh, you. Sir, uh, actually, uh, I'm very thankful to you for this uh, wonderful lecture. Actually, this type of analysis is very important uh, and a student will get a feel about this. Uh, uh, whatever you have explained, both time method. So this will be very good at the stage and uh, they will get uh, 
uh, insight about this uh, safety analysis and what uh, type of uh, measures we should take uh, while uh, uh, implementing this particular system and then uh, what you have said as of will be uh, useful for uh, detail analysis so this will be very good uh, thing and uh, no doubt the students have very good uh, uh, knowledge but that is fundamental knowledge and that will be uh, uh, once as you have said uh, once they enter in uh, uh, industry or uh, if they go for a certain training so that will be very good for them uh, for uh, their placement as well as they can uh, have good career in this uh, particular area so i am very thankful to you uh, for this wonderful lecture uh, i am thankful to saurav as well as my student friends uh, for attending this particular uh, uh, webinar thank you sir thank you for your kind words much appreciated I, yes. I love talking to you guys and it's been a pleasure so I can be of, uh, sir. One, in future uh, do not hesitate to call me uh, right right sir definitely sir okay then goodbye thank you sir and uh, uh, sort of i will send you all the data in in about a week's sure. time okay sure all right bye now yes yeah, sort will uh, share this to students as well as uh, faculty members so that will be useful for them also excellent yeah. take care bye bye, bye.